Well, good evening. Happy Valentine's Day again. Uh, good evening and welcome to Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. Tonight's program, Making Chocolate, Bean to Bar to S'more. <laughs> oh. Yep, that sounds about right. I'm Adam Savage. Tonight I have the pleasure of being in conversation with Todd Masona, CEO of Dandelion Chocolate, and Greg D'Alessandra, uh, the chocolate sorcerer that is an awesome job title. <laughs> <coughs> Talking all about making chocolate. Um, gentlemen, as purveyors of chocolate, I'm curious about your origin stories. Were you bit by a chocolate spider? <laughs> in in, the, in the, the book that you, got, that you, that you put out, you actually said, uh, one of you said, it was always going to end up like this. You were always, you were always directed towards that. So, so how, how come? Why, why is chocolate an inevitable for the two of you? Um, uh, I can't speak for Greg, but for <laughs> me, um, I have always loved chocolate. I, um, I mean, growing up, we always had cookies and cakes and all sorts of chocolate, and it wasn't really until I saw Sharpenberger come out that I had my first taste of real chocolate and uh, was sort of smitten. And, um, uh, you know, when um, we started Dandelion, uh, we kind of started just by trying to make chocolate at home. It's just sort of a, a fun obsession, hobby, DIY maker movement. And what we didn't realize then, but now we know, is that this is probably the most exciting time for chocolate in the last 150 years. And we just happened to <laughs> hit upon it at the exact moment. So it's just sort of the perfect confluence of factors. OK, before <laughs> I get to Greg's answer, okay, yeah. why is it the most exciting time for chocolate in 150 years? That's an awesome fact. So most of the world's chocolate's made by a few very large companies. Uh, and not the ones you would think of. ADM, Cargill, Barry Calvo, Blommer. Big, big guys make all the world's I chocolate. I don't buy any of their candy bars. Well, you, you <laughs> actually, you probably oh, do. do. Yeah, you do. You just don't know <laughs> yeah. it. Okay. Um, and so basically when sugar became industrialized, chocolate became industrialized. And when that happened, um, all of the interesting flavors, all of, you know, chocolate can actually have more flavor complexity than wine or coffee. All of that was lost. All of the varietals were lost. Everything that was interesting was lost. And there was this race for consistency and low cost. It was how do we get the world's cheapest beans? How do we make it super consistent so when you open up a Hershey's bar anywhere in the world, it tastes exactly the same? And it's a miracle of industrialization they pulled this off. Um, but um, uh, chocolate can be so much more. And so um, we are part of this growing new movement of American, it's actually spread past America now, of chocolate makers, people who actually get beans and make chocolate. And so when we started, there were maybe only about 10 or so small companies in America doing that, and now there are over 200. So it's sort of like what happened to microbrew, what happened to coffee, but is sort of following um, just a bit behind. Greg. What, what got you into chocolate? Uh, so I've loved chocolate my whole life, as I think almost everybody does. When I, when I find people that don't, yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> you find people like, I don't really like chocolate. Like, what? Um, but uh, I, when I was, I, I was, I was in chocolate, I was called, in chocolate, college. It was the same to me. <laughs> um, That's uh, a big <laughs> chocolate slip. I mean, yeah, 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 slip. exactly. Uh, <laughs> um, in college, I was like known as the chocolate guy, and my favorite story from college. Did you have like a trench coat? And you would give show people. <laughs> would you like a candy bar? You were the chocolate I, guy. So <laughs> it's funny you say that. <laughs> um, but I, uh, I, w I studied electrical engineering, um, which is how most chocolate makers get started is Clearly. in engineering. <laughs> but um, I. Uh, it, because I said electrical engineering, and um, I, bought a, I bought a book on how to make truffles. And when you make a truffle, you make what's called ganache. At the time, I had no idea what it was called, so I called it truffle filling, because... <laughs> um, and, uh, and so it's, it's, you know, cream and sometimes butter and chocolate. And at the time, I was in college, and I was like, oh, you can also put alcohol in it, which sounded great. <laughs> <laughs> like, anything you could put alcohol yeah, in sounds exactly. great in college. Uh, and so I added... So I made this ganache truffle filling. Uh, I put too much alcohol in it because I also thought, as one does in college, like more alcohol makes this thing better, <laughs> right? Um, why there's awful punch in college. But um, <laughs> anyway, so, I, so, so then what you're supposed to do with ganache is you, know, you let it cool and you let it set and then you form it in the balls. Uh, with too much alcohol, I was like, clearly the problem here is my freezer's not cold enough. <laughs> right? I mean, like, it has nothing to do with what I've done wrong in the making of the ganache. And so I went to uh, the physics lab, which I was just down the street from, and got a thermos of liquid nitrogen. <laughs> and, like, took a melon baller and, like, of this, like, goop, and then, like, super cooled it. And, like, my roommates at the time were like, they, 
again, I went to a college with no other engineers, and so they're all like English majors, et cetera. And they were like, what are you doing? And I was like, it's going to be great. Um, and uh, so I would like super cool the like centers and then drop them into melted chocolate because I didn't know what tempering was at the time. I was very young. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, it would form these like, these like crazy patterns because it would like it would like shock the chocolate, and you'd pull out these like fully formed truffles that would then like come back to room temperature and melt inside the shell. So they're like liquid insides uh, to it, um, and yeah, it was awesome. I, <laughs> I, unfortunately, it um, also at the time uh, the woman I was dating at the time, I was like, I made you truffles, and she was like. B with liquid nitrogen, like, is that dangerous? And I was like, it's nitrogen. <laughs> <laughs> you breathe it. It's probably not. Yeah, that's what, that was literally what I said. Like, I don't think so. The high likelihood of death. I, you know. Anyway, so my whole life, I've wanted to be in chocolate, and every job I ever had, I was in tech for most of my life, and every job I ever had, I was like, this is great, but at some point, I'm quitting and making chocolate. Wow. And every single person would be like, sure you are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, but my favorite statement was when I quit, my, m before doing this, I was at Google. And when I quit the job at Google, I said to my manager at the time, uh, I'm leaving, I'm gonna go make chocolate. And her <laughs> like, gut reaction was, but you're so smart. <laughs> <laughs> But like it's this like fascinating thing. I was like, so so like, do you think dumb people make chocolate? Like when it, like, <laughs> it was just really it was really fascinating. Anyway, it, it really gave me some insight into I was making the right move. So, um. <laughs> uh, it, is today is today the Christmas of the chocolate business? Is this where you make <laughs> so like seventy percent of your so income today? Uh, I'd say that so Christmas is the Christmas of <laughs> yeah, chocolate. Uh, okay. But uh, not fun. Valentine's Day is a very big day for us. But we were talking earlier. But the thing that's hilarious is. I'd say most people, if you look at Dandelion uh, on a normal day, we have a very high percentage of women compared to men. Shocking. This is the one day of year you look in the cafe, it's 95% men, uh, <laughs> mostly looking pretty frantic uh, coming it's in. It's tech bros going where the women uh, hang out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's all, well, everyone's getting their last minute uh, Valentine's Day gifts, so it's, it's just hilarious to see the change in, in pattern today. Have you considered um, increasing your revenue by uh, having surge prices, like later <laughs> in the afternoon? If you come by tonight and you still need chocolate, it's yeah, going to be. Yeah, it'll be $300. It, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want this bar, this bar. Yeah. Well, speaking of surge pricing, you've chosen to open a business in San Francisco, one of the more expensive cities in the country. Um, I'm curious, why here? What is it about San Francisco that makes this the place you wanted to open a business? I think we wanted to have the business here because this is where we are and this is a great city. Um, I think that especially we got very lucky with being on Valencia Street, which is surrounded by some other amazing food brands. Um, and it has a, sort of a cool food culture, um, and it just it fit the vibe of where we wanted to be. And we could have chosen a much less expensive place to be, and certainly we've had a number of troubles with permits and zoning and construction and all sorts of things that come with San Francisco. Um, but on the other end of it, we've had such an outpouring of support, um, especially launching something from scratch that's a whole new concept or category. I don't think we could have been um, had as much pickup being anywhere else than in San Francisco proper. Fascinating. I, I, and um, most chocolate makers, you know, the ones that Todd's talking about, you don't see their factories because they're nowhere you've ever been before, right? Most chocolate makers uh, go in places where like labor is really cheap and land is really cheap and there's a port nearby. Um, turns out Iceland is where that should be. <laughs> but like, y you know, uh, um, but, and so, and so like part of the idea is like, Nobody knows what a chocolate factory looks like on the inside other than what you saw in Willy Wonka, which it turns out is not what it looks like on the inside no, you all the time. You can't get stuck in the tubes? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, we get, we get stuck in tubes, but like... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but and so like part of the idea is like get people like understanding that there's no magic to this. Like it's it sounds strange, but we, in many ways we try to like de-romanticize chocolate by like having people understand that like you know it's beans and like the number of people come in and say why do you have coffee beans here and we're like they're cocoa beans. They're like what's a cocoa bean? Starts a conversation. Okay, you know? well that actually leads to my next question because I reading your the book you guys put out, I I was overwhelmed by the number of in every step in chocolate, everything affects the final product. So yeah. can we start with just what is chocolate? Uh, okay, sure, that's easy. <laughs> chocolate, <laughs> chocolate's a colloid. Um, no, that's good. Uh, um, chocolate is a colloid. But uh, cho the, the, the simplest thing that you can describe chocolate as is, uh, is uh, a fat system 
again, de-romanticizing. Mm -hmm. It's a fat system with, uh, with cacao, and you can put sugar in it, but you don't even need sugar. I mean, it's ground up cocoa beans can be chocolate. According to the FDA, you actually need sugar in it for it to be called chocolate. Ah. But like, <coughs> um, it's, it's ground up cocoa beans. When you ground up the cocoa beans, the fat's released, so it creates this fat system, and suspended in the fat are these the particles of what's left in the cocoa beans and sugar. That's like, that's all chocolate really is. And people do all sorts of things. Todd had talked about um, the industrialization of chocolate. And like, so people added things like lecithin and extra cocoa butter in, in many ways to make things easier, make the chocolate easier to work with. But when you get right down to it, when you go to Belize and someone's making a chocolate drink, they take cocoa, they get rid of the husk because it doesn't taste as good, and they grind it down on stone and like add a little sugar and there you have it, chocolate. You can. We, we've been to Burning Man and made chocolate on the playa at Burning Man. It's that easy to make. It tastes a little dusty. Can you walk me through the process of, of, I mean, if everything affects the taste, does that mean that every time I go to Dandelion, I'm going to taste a different, a completely different kind of product? Um, so there's actually a, a joke in the chocolate making world, which is what is the, the most important step in the chocolate making process? And the joke is every step is the most important step. Um, because if you're making sort of two ingredient um, single origin chocolate, um, every little point along the way is an opportunity to mess it up. Because um, there's nowhere to hide because we don't have added a lot of added sugar. We're not doing a heavy roast. Um, and so we, there is some natural variability in our beans and in our chocolate. But what we actually like to do is when we get a new harvest of beans, um, for instance, the Madagascar beans, every year that bean is fruity. But some years it tastes like strawberries, some years it tastes like cherries, mm. some years it tastes like raisins. And rather than try to make every bar year to year taste exactly the same and say it's Madagascar and we sort of get lowest common denominator, instead we just say, this is the 2018 bar. This year, it tastes like cherries. If you liked last year's bar, you should have bought more of that because it's it's no more. It's, uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's just like wine. Does, yeah. this mean, uh, does this mean that there are in your pasts, each of you, like a chocolate that you will never taste again yes, and miss? Yes, it does. Well, That's so sad. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually remember the first batch of chocolate we ever made in the garage with our little like toaster oven. And we mixed together some uh, Panamanian and Dominican Republic beans. We didn't have the ratios. We didn't do anything. We just put them in. And that first batch of chocolate was amazing. And we said, well, this is so easy. This is like, you know, we just got super lucky. You got it uh, right. We just got lucky. We and I think there's, if we hadn't got lucky, we'd have said, oh, it's really hard. Well, we shouldn't do this. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but now there's sort of that mythical batch of, I actually don't know, was that just really an amazing batch of chocolate? Or is my memory of that sort right. of nostalgia? Uh, what can you... What did it? What was it close to? Can you give some idea about that magical batch? Uh, it was just super chocolatey, and it was something we. Uh, well, <laughs> no. So when we talk about flavor <laughs> notes, um, chocolate is one of our notes in chocolate um, because we. Uh, <laughs> We That's have, handy. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> we have like fruity bars, nutty bars, and in fact, we um, in our lineup, we always try to have at least one or two very chocolatey bars <laughs> because we would like people to walk in and try a bite and say, "Oh, that's the that's the it's a dark chocolate, but it's more similar to what I'm used to." And whereas they go to the Madagascar bar and they're like, "I didn't know chocolate could taste like this," and so we like to have a progression. Um, but so I think that bar was a super chocolatey, but also it was the first bar that we had made. I think a lot of people don't realize that you can at home make an amazing batch of chocolate and really. There's only one piece of equipment you really need to buy, and that's uh, called a mini melanger, and it's about $200. You get it on Amazon Prime. You can have it tomorrow. A mini melanger? A mini melanger, uh, or a wet grinder. Um, it's, a, it's used in Indian cooking. It has a, it's a small bowl that rotates with an, a granite base and uh, two granite stones. And um, one outside. Oh, yeah. Oh. So afterwards, if you want, we have the whole chocolate making process going outside. Um, that's, uh, you can roast beans in your oven. You can take uh, uh, a rolling pin and crack the beans afterwards. You can take a hair dryer and blow off the shell. You can then put them in the mini melange with sugar, and a day later, you might have some of the best tasting chocolate oh. ever. And so it's, um, so I think just that act of saying like, oh, this is something that usually people never <coughs> made at home, you can do that and you could have amazing chocolate. Lovely. J just as a side note, my first batch of chocolate <laughs> that I made at Dandelion, they were like, oh, try these beans. And so I tried them and I roasted them and <laughs> I thought they smelled like tar and gasoline mixed together. <laughs> and I like, love that. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is chocolate. Oh, okay. And, you know, and then I like put them in the machine and ground them up and it's like still smells awful. And then I tasted it and I totally thought I'd poisoned myself. <laughs> I was like, oh God. 
like call the ambulance and then and then I find out they're like, oh yeah, those are awful. We just curious what you thought about them too. And I was like, no, they're awful. <laughs> That's like, the it was like <laughs> you experienced the, you experienced that this tastes funny. Here, try it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> chocolate haze. Uh, so I, I have two chocolate traumas in my past. One oh. was discovering that giant chocolate bar in my parents' larder mm. and taking a huge mm. bite and wondering why they booby trapped it <laughs> with bitter chocolate. Uh. Um, but another was a few years later, I was probably like 12 years old and we were at a Mexican restaurant and I was like, oh, I'll have the chocolate Mexican food, <laughs> mole. And it wasn't what I expected. I now love mole. Um, but chocolate's been used in all sorts of different places that are unexpected. Uh, in California, of course, we know mole, but like, what is the most unexpected like cuisine or utilization of chocolate you've come across? Well, so I travel a lot as a sorcerer, one does. <laughs> sorcerer, <Yeah>. yes. um, uh, <laughs> and, uh, um, and one of my favorite things to do is find the like weirdest thing that like people are making out of it. And one of the things is, um, so, uh, so cocoa pods are a fruit, right? It's a tropical fruit. Um, and so inside the pod itself, there's like a, there's like a, f uh, a white flesh the fruit of it, and then there are beans within that, or seeds within that, right? Like any other fruit. And a lot of people um, haven't often tried that, the fruit part itself, but so lots of people make things out of the fruit part, and lots of people, in order to get good cocoa beans, you have to ferment that fruit, which is kind of a long process, and we can go into detail later if you're curious, but basically it creates uh, alcohol, which then creates acetic acid. Acetic acid soaks into the cocoa beans, breaks the you know beans down, and creates these awesome flavor c precursors. But anytime, so now it's going to seem like all I ever talk about is alcohol. <laughs> it's twice. <laughs> this is just twice. That's it. And that's I'm done with the alcohol. Yeah, I um, you said it. I didn't. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, um, so a lot of people make really fascinating alcoholic beverages because you're fermenting it anyway and so right. you're producing alcohol mm -hmm. and if you're on a cocoa farm like you know you're spending your time harvesting cocoa you know harvesting food eating food and like drinking whatever booze you can make sometimes um and so like a lot of people make really interesting alcoholic things out of the fruit traveling around uh visiting suppliers what makes a uh, for you guys a good cocoa bean supplier uh so um, we, we talk about like there's three things we, we look for is like good people, good consistency, and good flavor. Um, uh, and the consistency refers to the people and the flavor. I was going to say, that if, <laughs> um, if you're interested yeah. in <laughs> alternative tastes and the taste changing, what does consistency mean? Well, and, and the consistency really is less about like this tastes the same all the time and more about like, um, w you know, we all approach the world in a certain way. And so it's it's about, you know, when we are working together, uh, are we, do we see, see eye to eye and like interact with the world mm -hmm. in, in a consistent way? It's not always necessarily the same way. I mean, we live in other countries, you know, in very different conditions. Um, and again, to continue to de-romanticize, which is apparently what you do on Valentine's Day. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, they, like, I, I think a lot of the people we work with are, we work with, you know, large, uh, um, people who, you know, buy cocoa beans from a lot of small farmers, and we, um, small, p small farmers, not like short people, but like <laughs> farmers that have a small hobbits. amounts of hobbits, hobbits, yes, yeah. we mostly work with. Um, but, you know, and then we work with some, like, larger estates. Um, most cocoa in the world is not plantation grown, most of it's grown by people who have two to four acres of land, and this is where they grow their food, and they grow something to make a little money to typically help give their kids education is mostly what people are often using money for. And But we work with a lot of different kinds of people, and so like one of the main things we look for is someone we can work with, honestly. It, because the flavor will change over time, as Todd said, and um, but you know, it's kind of like when you talk about buying a house, and it's like the, your location will never change. Mm -hmm. You can rebuild the house as much as you want, but like you are where you are. The people you're working with are the people you're working with, and so like flavor can change, and you know all these other things can change. But that's the bones of the organization, and so we look for people we get along well with. You know, and Todd, you were saying that, that every part of the process is the most important part of the process, but clearly that means that uh, different chocolate makers will choose to 
enhance or concentrate on certain parts of the process. What, uh, what is your guys' process for making chocolate and where do you put your attention right now? Um, sure, so I would say that we're part of this new American chocolate movement and within that movement there are, are a range of different styles and approaches and we just have what we like to do, the type of chocolate we like to make, but we actually encourage people to go out and go to a store like Chocolate Covered or Fog City News um, that has a wide variety of chocolates and try them um, because uh, our particular style is two ingredient, so ju just cocoa beans and sugar. Most other high-end chocolate bars would have, would have added cocoa butter, vanilla, lecithin. Um, you might also have all sorts of flavor inclusions. Um, and we also like to do a very light roast. So our style is all about getting amazing beans and letting those flavors come through. So when we'll make 70% um, bars, two ingredients, all the same ratio. If you taste one bar versus another versus another, you should taste the inherent differences in the bean. So that's for our particular style. But we've actually, um, we've had times where we've gotten a shipment of beans and we couldn't make good chocolate out of them. Oh. And, um, and, we, uh, and we didn't like their flavors, um, and we ended up selling them to some other makers who won some national awards for them because they have a different style, they added cocoa butter, they had a different point of view. And so um, I think what's so interesting is right now there are all these different people trying all different techniques. Um, and so in terms of our process, do you, do you want to talk about the process of... Please. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a couple uh, pictures if you want to see, just because yeah. it might be hard to visualize if you haven't been into... Um, our factory on Valencia Street, but let's see if we can pull this up. Yeah, so uh, just real quick, this is not us. Uh, this is, <laughs> this is, uh, this, this is, guy's awesome. This is when uh, he I, seems a little smug. Uh, so I just, threw, <laughs> <laughs> I just threw this in here to say uh, we are not a chocolatier, we are a chocolate maker. What is the difference? So um, I wrote chocolatier here because it's a cool word, but and it is. so. So and I think when people think of chocolate and chocolatiers, they're thinking of this. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That's a great skill. But we are a chocolate maker, so we are concerned with getting cocoa beans and making chocolate. The chocolatier would buy chocolate and make chocolates. Oh. Mm. Does that make sense? Beans yeah. to chocolate versus chocolate to chocolates. So we are all concerned with how do we get great beans and turn them into chocolate. And so if you want the world's fastest tour of making chocolate, that is a cacao pod growing on a tree. Okay. They look like little Nerf footballs. Uh, <laughs> and um, could you, can meal. you eat them raw? Um, so if you, uh, if you were to cut one open, mm -hmm. Uh, so here's a video. This is Cameron, uh, our co-founder, doing a very bad job of um, <laughs> trying working to on a bagel cut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so if you actually scoop out the inside, you will see all those. Uh, <laughs> you know, if we have videos of the farmers doing it. They take one second. Um, but so uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, inside, you scoop out the the fruit and the seeds together. The fruit is kind of this white, sort of slimy, they call it mucilage. Uh, yeah, sorry, he's not very good at this. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yummy word. <laughs> uh, so there's this mucilage that surrounds the bean, and that's the fruit. And if you suck on that, that's amazing. That's a beautiful oh, wow. tropical fruit. If you then eat the seed, it is super bitter and does not taste very good. So it's sort of a miracle that anyone figured out how to turn that seed that tastes not very good into delicious chocolate. Yeah. So it gets scooped out. That's, you can see these are the, the seeds, the cocoa beans with a bit of white fruit around them. Um, the, uh, the, the farmers will ferment them. So they'll put them in these wooden boxes. And uh, basically, as Greg was saying, the, the yeast in the air will eat the fruit and create alcohol. And then the, the bacteria will eat the alcohol and create acid. It'll penetrate the bean and sort of change the flavor of the bean. And so they go through this process where they'll actually um, sort of turn the beans. So every day, they'll um, sort of move them into different boxes and um, sort of agitate them. This is the chocolate equivalent of like the stamping in the barrel of wine. Actually, uh, yeah, actually. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the thing that we, we should say about fermentation, though, is when you look at the wine industry, they are like 100 years at least ahead of chocolate. Um, this is still super early days because it's all been about commodity cacao. How do we just always m have a really cheap, not, you know, cheap set of not great beans? Whereas we're trying to get fine flavor cacao where it has good genetics, good flavor, good fermentation. So they get fermented, uh, they get dried, different styles of drying. And any of these we can always, you know, talk more on. Um, they can be dried in drying beds. Uh, you, uh, then they get put in bags and sent to us. So all that happens on the farm before we even see the beans. And, and as the chocolate sorcerer, you go around the world visiting people with all these different techniques, buying different kinds of bags. Yeah, I, um, so <laughs> I've, I've been to 25-ish cocoa growing countries, like hundreds of cocoa farms. Um, and, but I think it, it like, I always
always joke that like it, it probably seems like I'm like you know riding a motorcycle through the jungle <laughs> and you know like you like grab Ciao. odd and you, exactly exactly <laughs> got a monkey on the shoulder right and I was like um, and but it's more like I fly in and I'm like where am I and someone picks me up at the airport and then they like take me to like talk and like a lot of what I'm doing when I'm there is understanding the process partially. So I understand, like, when something goes wrong and these beans taste bad, like, what happened? Like, wh where could it have gone wrong in the process? Um, but also because uh, a lot of cocoa producers don't spend a lot of time traveling to a lot of other parts of the world that produce cocoa, most of them learned how to ferment and dry cocoa from, like, the guys next to them who learned from right. the guys next to them. It, like, I try to cross-pollinate. So you can bring knowledge to... Right. It, okay. it, and again, like I don't do it all day every day, yeah. so I'm not like I wouldn't call myself an expert, but um, I I at least you You're know as close to an expert as they've met. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I sure. That's useful. Yeah. Exactly. I, I that's what I'll say. I, like I'm not a sorcerer. <laughs> I'm close to an expert. I'm, I'm expert <laughs> enough for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, do, um, you, do, you, um, do you gain a, an ability to taste a bean and know that it's going to be good chocolate, or is that always something that comes out in the process? So. I've gained an ability. I'm making myself sound really incompetent, but like I'm, I'm pretty good at this. I, uh, I've gained an ability to taste beans and know if it's going to make bad chocolate. Um, <laughs> no, and th this is yeah. an important skill. It's uh, <laughs> like it took me years to get good at this. <laughs> um, but like if you like, there are certain off flavors that you know. Like if it's a little bitter, you're like, okay, we, you know, depending on how we roast it, it'll taste different. But if you taste like a uh, like metallic flavor, it's mineralic acid, which comes in at the end of the fermentation process, and like you're not getting rid of during the chalk making. Wow. Process. So it's like you can identify like some of these flavors that like you're like, nah, that's not going away. Versus like. Okay, there's something weird there, but I think we can deal with it in the process. Um, and so, like, part of what I do is I understand: will this make bad chocolate, or somewhere in the range of like okay to awesome chocolate? And then, if it's somewhere in the range of okay to awesome chocolate, I bring beans back and we make chocolate here. We have, a, you know, a, a team of people who we work with on this. Um, Todd and I make very little chocolate ourselves, right? right? Um, but like, we have a team of people that that like put the you know, samples together, and then we have like 20 people try it, yeah. right? And you know, because I think part of the goal also is like we don't, we don't want to make chocolate based on just my palate or just Todd's palate. We want to make chocolate that has like interesting variety to it, and that means like some of the bars we make are not my favorite. Right. I wouldn't say which ones because the producers are all my favorite. They're like my <laughs> children. Yeah. Right? Every yeah. single one is my favorite. Yeah. Um, but uh, but like some of the bars, like it's not my style. It's not the kind of thing I'm excited about. But like. Lots of other people like it, and that's good. Well, you, you you must have a wide variance of chocolate preferences among your staff. How many people yeah. are working for you guys here in San Francisco? Uh, we have about 80 people. And, and uh, like, some of them you radically disagree with their chocolate tastes, and some of them you aspire? <laughs> so I think it's more that we're trying to create bars that are pretty polarizing. Um, so I think it's possible to make uh, take all of the origins and make them generally pleasing. Um, but that's never been our goal. It's always been about what is the best expression of a particular bean. And so um, we're trying to get that flavor out of it that really represents something interesting. And that means that some of our bars, uh, I, there are many of our bars that people have said, this is like the favorite bar I've ever had in my life. And, but then those other people will have that same bar and say, I can't eat this. I don't think it tastes very good. And so what we always do is we let people sample and find what they like because uh, there are very different taste preferences, even amongst the company, amongst our customers and it, lots of different flavors in chocolate. It's a fascinating philosophy to, to bring out just what is in the chocolate, not your own preference. Um, I get a lot of crap for one of my preferences, <coughs> uh -oh. which is I love white chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's also my rapper name. But... <laughs> I, I am, am, am I just a Philistine? Am I a Philistine? No, you just have bad taste. I mean, it's not like... <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. I was joking. I, it's, I, I mean, just so everyone knows what white chocolate is, white chocolate is cocoa butter, which is basically fat, sugar, um, uh, like milk fat. Yeah. So like more fat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a little bit of vanilla to flavor it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I mean, like, you know, it's not, it's not bad. I mean... But cocoa butter, right? So it does come from chocolate... It, so people who say it's not real chocolate, like that's it, what it everyone says to me. It, I, <laughs> I would have said it to you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but like, yeah, it does come from a cocoa pod. But like, I mean, lip balm does too, and you don't eat that. Yeah. <laughs> 
in a pinch. <laughs> yeah, OK, fair enough. <laughs> but we, we can give you a, a white chocolate pro tip, which is if you are going to eat white chocolate, there's yeah. one, there one you should eat. It's the Askinosi white chocolate. It's which? Askinosi. OK. Springfield, Missouri, a small maker. He presses his own cocoa butter on an antique press. It only has three ingredients, um, which is the minimum by law to be white chocolate. Um, it's not deodorized cocoa butter. It is natural and as artisan as you can get. So if you're going to eat one, that's the one. So prepare me for how different that will be from a standard Nestle's white chocolate bar. It'll so, have flavor. <laughs> 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 well, and also, um, uh, you know, most white chocolate first ingredient is sugar, uh, a lot of deodorized cocoa butter, other flavorings, other things trying to mask things. It's, uh, you know, um, just like leftover, not great beans. Um, so there's a big difference between like the artisan approach and the industrial approach. So that's the, that's the one that's in the new American category for white chocolate. When you're talking about bringing out the bean um, and that you make bars that might not be to your personal preferences, have you had a, let's say, a, a, a bar, a chocolate that was made that's not to your personal preference that was then used in a dish in a totally novel way that yes. was to your preference and you were really surprised? Here, I just built a whole narrative. Uh, now fill it in. No, I mean, I, I would argue the, the, the red velvet cake was that one for me. Yeah, well, I mean, I think actually one of the things that's super uh, um, awesome is every year we do the 12 nights of chocolate, where we um, shut down the cafe for 12 nights in a row, and we invite um, some of the best uh, chefs around the city to uh, come in and do a fundraiser for, for the food bank, yeah. um, and uh, they use our chocolate. And the, uh, the things that the chefs have created with our chocolate, uh, mole, um, all, I don't know, I, there's, can you name all? There's, every day is like five courses with all different um, uses of the chocolate and are ways that we don't use in the cafe. Do you get any sleep during that week? Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's because of the caffeine. Yeah, yeah no, I know. <laughs> Humming along. Yeah. Um, but so there are actually some really interesting you, things you can do with really great chocolate, and we're just kind of scratching the surface of that. Um, and that's kind of our one time of year we get to play with those things. Um, before we used refined sugar uh, uh, as, a, mm -hmm. as a culture, we used molasses. Yeah. And not many people know that molasses was often stored in cities in giant tanks. And famously in 1919, I, 1919? <laughs> yeah, 1919, um, a molasses tank burst in Boston, causing a molasses flood that seriously killed, uh, killed 21 people and injured 150. <laughs> this is the longest way to ask. <laughs> um, as lasts. chocolate makers, you must have encountered many different oh, chocolate-based disasters. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dying to hear them. Uh, I can think of at least two. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, so uh, we haven't had chocolate floods, uh, but one of our machines, the Melanger's, the big ones, sometimes they will break and we will come in the next morning and they will have solidified <gasps> and you have 130 pounds of chocolate in a big block, which normally be pretty cool, except it's stuck inside a machine and you've got to get a heat gun and a glove and get in there for a couple hours. Um, so that's not fun. The other big chocolate disaster, and this is one that hasn't really happened to us, uh, but does happen to other small makers, um, is cocoa moths. Cocoa? Cocoa moths. Cocoa moths. So that's the, the big scary. So if you that's don't. It's not a euphemism. It's a moth that likes cocoa. Like, yeah. okay. So we actually, we freeze all of our beans um, and we store them cold. We make sure there are never any cocoa moths. But cocoa moths, uh, if one were to get into your factory from your beans and land on a chocolate bar and then someone wraps it, six months later, they'll open it up and they will find a worm chocolate bar. And uh, that would be the Deep worst romantic. possible thing that could happen. And so we, we've known other people that's happened to, and so we take that super seriously, and that's a disaster we never want to have happen. That's terrifying. My, my, my favorite story I heard from another chocolate maker was, uh, this was a chocolate maker in Utah, that, um, so, so Todd talks about these melangers, which are these you know, big drums that are spinning, and when you em to empty them out, you like pour them, you, you, you know, angle them down and pour, and the chocolate pours out. Um, and so there was a chocolate maker who just hired a guy, and he was, and the guy he had hired was trying to empty this melanger, and um, Robbie, the chocolate maker, was, like, talking to somebody, and he, like, he was talking to this guy, and behind him you could see the employee who had taken a hotel pan and was, like, holding it with one hand. Yeah, right? I mean, like, you can see where this is going, right? Where it's, like, this heavy thing. So it pours it into it, and apparently, <laughs> the, like, as soon as it hit the pan, it, like, flips out of his hand, like, sprays chocolate all, all over the place. With The guy slips in the chocolate. <laughs> the melanger, like, fall, comes down all the way and dumps chocolate all over him as he's, like, talking to this customer. Like, <laughs> like eyes getting wider, like, <laughs> watching this thing happen behind him. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, those things happen. That's just as awesome as I was hoping. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? Um, I was amazed, be, uh, being an engineer by, by trade, um, I, 
I know what it is to temper steel. Mm. And I didn't realize that tempering chocolate was the exact same the exact thing. Exact same thing. D describe what that really means from, from a chocolate perspective. Well, I, I, I mean, so temp so in fairness, it's not exactly, it's, but it's very close. I, like, you know, the, a the similar the mechanical it's process. A si exactly. And because like, what you're trying to do in tempering chocolate is you're trying, um, cocoa butter has six different crystal states that it can get to. Right, um, and uh, and each one is defined by the temperature that the crystal melts at, and so form five is the f the form you want in chocolate because that's the one that melts in your mouth in that like very pleasing way. Forms one through four melt at a lower temperature, and so like m will melt unevenly or in your hands or sort of inconsistently. Whereas form six melts at a higher temperature. If you've ever had chocolate where you've like it's really hard and you bite it, and then as you're chewing it, it doesn't melt, but it kind of like turns to powder in your mouth. It's either white chocolate, just kidding, <laughs> um, <laughs> or, uh, or, or it's like form six chocolate, right? Um, and, and so, but like what you're trying to do is you're trying to form a consistent crystalline structure, and it, but it's very much the same thing as steel, because like when you're, what you're trying to do is form a consistent structure, and like, uh, so it is, it's going to be harder, it's going to be more brittle because it's harder, just like steel. Right. Um, uh, and but it also will melt at a different temperature, and so it's it's m a little more durable. Um, God, this, I'm, we're really talking about this like there's no romanticism to chocolate. I at told all. you we it's were going to get into the weeds. Yeah, this <laughs> is the weeds. But um, yeah, so it's very very similar to tempering steel, and you do it for very similar reasons too. To get those specific types of hardness out of it. Exactly. Um, I'm I'm curious about. Uh, do you guys refer to the the, the, pro the famous Portlandia cacao sketch on an almost daily basis? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> is it a, is it like a, something you do in meetings when someone's going a little too far? <laughs> no, but we will. That's, That's yeah, a good idea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a safe word for me. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, given that California has recently just passed a, an mm -hmm. initiative, are you guys thinking about moving into edibles? Edible chocolate? Uh, Our chocolate's very yeah. edible today. Uh, Excellent. <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. I wouldn't say, I'd say at least for me, my passion is chocolate, not uh, other things. So uh, it's not something as a company we've really thought hard about, but maybe someday we might partner with somebody. Um, but it's not, it's not a priority right now. Interesting. The, okay. the thing that did happen is as soon as that happened, the lab that we used to do, because we do a lot of tests, like, we're sciencey people. We like to understand what's going on. So we are, we're like constantly testing, like you know, like the the like um, uh, for for like contamination in chocolate and like you know fat content and all these things. So we have like numbers around the chocolate. Uh, and um, as soon as uh, as soon as California cannabis became legal. Uh, the lab we use, like 95% of their business went to cannabis testing. It was like fascinating. They were suddenly like they had no time for us. Before we were like very important. They were like, come on by. And now they're like, who are you? Oh, you're not testing cannabis, whatever. Um, Have you guys in the research that you do, I mean, it's clear you both really love the mechanics and the science behind this, spent a lot of time uncovering something that turned out to be common knowledge? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> well, uh, uh, you can answer that one. Um, <laughs> I, 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 like, I, I, it's, it's one. It, there's a lot of this like common wisdom. So one of the things is because we're actually using much different ingredients than like big chalk makers. Husk is the thing that I was thinking, which is oh. why. Uh, yeah. Um, so so the outside of the cocoa bean classically is considered bad. Because if you're if you're growing these beans in very unsanitary environments and like there's mold on them, you'll get mycotoxins and all this. So so common wisdom is husk is unusable, but like we're getting beans from people who have like hand tempered. That's not that's not a word. Um, hand like um, fermented each bean, you know, bean in small boxes and everything's very clean and you know the drying rack, et cetera. So our, the husk we have is is beautiful and really and actually has really interesting flavor to it. So there's this really interesting thing going on in the industry where some people are like, you can't use husk, it's awful. And we're like, but we've done all the, like, to me, this is science. Mm -hmm. Science is not like someone did a study at one point and now everyone believes it, right? Science is, I'm not just pandering to the Mythbuster. Um, <laughs> science is like, but, but science really is like, well, like, like take those assumptions and yeah. test them and then see if they're still true. And if they're not true anymore, update your knowledge. Don't just keep on believing that what you believed is true is always going to be true. And like a lot of that's going on right now in the chocolate industry because we're just working with different stuff than the, the, the 
classic large scale chocolate industry has been working with. So it's been very interesting and very, in, in many ways, uh, challenging to cut through some of that noise. Um, have you found yourself in, so I'm just imagining, you know, you're, you're going to look uh, for a, a supplier. Has there been a time when the weirdest place in the world where you were like, I'm going to die here, oh. turned out to be an amazing... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I mean, so, uh, yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> there's, <laughs> it's, there's, like, there's definitely a number of times where people have said, like, um, I remember one time we were in Guatemala, and uh, we're... We're, and so, you know, uh, cocoa only grows in the tropics between tw 20 degrees north and south of the equator. And um, in the tropics, the sun goes down around 6 o'clock every night. And so we're driving, and it's like 545. And uh, the guy's like, yeah, we can't wait to show you this place. That it's, it's this beautiful lake in Guatemala, Lago Lechua, which is um, a perfectly circular lake. And they say it's the lake protected by chocolate. All these cocoa producers started growing cocoa because it, it, it was a World Heritage site and they wanted to protect it. And you need money to protect things with like guns, literally, or else people will come and log and you know, so you need to protect things. Um, and uh, they were like, oh yeah, this is gonna be great. Um, we can't wait for you to show it. And then as we're driving, it's like 6.45, 6.50. And he goes, we'll be there in probably half an hour. And then when we get there, it's only maybe an hour, hour and a half hike through the jungle to get to the, <laughs> and like, I'm dressed like this. And I'm like, <laughs> Oh, okay. And, but like you can never, you, you can't let anything phase you because then everyone's like, oh, we don't have to, we don't have to. And then you miss out on awesome stuff. Right. Right. And so right. it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, great, great. Do you, do you have flashlights? Like, <laughs> like, you know, and they're like, why would you need a flashlight? There's the moon. And I'm like, yeah, there's the moon. <laughs> You're right. That's what I meant. And snakes. Are there snakes? You know, like, uh, yeah. And then, and so, but we did. We like, like no light. Like, walked through the jungle, like, for an hour and a half. I have no idea how he didn't f try. And, like, we got there, and the guy literally said, wow, there are so many fewer snakes this time than normally. <laughs> 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 and I was like, fewer? <laughs> you saw some? <laughs> right? I, I was like. <laughs> you could advertise the chocolate is now with less snakes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like. <laughs> Um, is it really true that a guy with a bird sanctuary walked through your door and turned out to be a great supplier? Yeah, yeah, Charles Kirshner um, indeed came into our shop and said, like, hey, I make cocoa. And, like, the number of people who – there was a guy who drove up in a pickup truck outside of our shop at, like, 10 o'clock at night and, like, knocks on the window and goes, do you guys buy cocoa? And we're like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, like, and literally the, the bed of his truck was filled with cocoa beans, not bags of cocoa beans like that. Literally just, like – but I mean, like, what did he bathe in? Them? Yeah, no, that's what I was like. Where? How did? Did you drive here from like somewhere that grows cocoa and just like decided to toss them in the back of your truck? <laughs> the they were the awful cocoa beans too. We tried them. Oh, they really? Were awful, <laughs> right? Oh, but but yeah, Charles Kirshner came into our shop um, and was basically like, oh, I have this like bird sanctuary. It was funny because when I first was telling people at Dandelion, oh, there's this guy, bird sanctuary, all anyone could think of, and I apologize if this is going to put this thought in your head now, but I'm gonna do it anyway. All people thought it was like bird plant like trees you know and like is like like bird poop chocolate was all anyone oh. could think of right because they were like oh there's a lot of birds there huh um but um but yeah he he basically it's the first private reserve in the dominican republic we're actually going on a trip there in may this is not like a shameless pit that actually it's a shameless pit okay. we're going on there a trip in may and take customers with us if you're interested in going but it is a bird sanctuary in the dominican republic it's the first private reserve where he has a thousand acres of land 800 of it is forever wild as this as as a sanctuary, and then two hundred they grow macadamia nuts and cocoa, and they have bees um, that pollinate everything, and they sell that to make money to protect all the land. And it's like amazing. There's a river that runs through it, um, uh, and it's just and it's it's out in the mountains. Uh, it's um, it's really beautiful. But like he really did just like wander in and said like, oh, you guys make chocolate. Now ironically. I heard from like three other chocolate makers that exactly the same thing happened. He like wandered in like, oh, you guys make chocolate? So it might be his <laughs> shit, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, but, but like, um, and we, we work with him very closely now, buy a lot of beans from him and like really love working with those guys. They're, they're really awesome. Now, after you've met the supplier, you bring the beans back. Do you guys have a standard method by which you test and experiment with the beans? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, the first thing we do is we make a small batch of chocolate, and if, I mean, we actually have more slides if you want to, do you want to see yeah, some yeah, chocolate? Yeah, yeah, please, yeah. yeah. And we'll just go again, the, the world's fastest tour of our factory, but, um, so those are cocoa beans after they've been fermented and dried, um, that's what they look like. Um, the first thing we do is we sort through the beans, so we're looking for anything weird, 
Um, and that can be... Uh, what kind of weird? Well, uh, so in this picture, we've got some plastic. We, uh, I guess we should update this picture. We, have, we found razor blades. We, we found, found frog. corn and frogs. Um, and so I'd say that all, all chocolate companies hopefully are removing the razor blades and the metal and all that. But we, um, we go a step beyond and we remove anything that's even ever so slightly cracked or out of spec because we have done blind taste tests. We always do everything through testing. We make a batch of chocolate straight out of the bag versus one that we have hand prepared versus the reject bean. Oh. And um, even though the reject beans make some great chocolate, because we're buying the world's best chocolate beans, um, uh, every single person on blind taste test could tell the difference between those sorted beans and the other wow. beans. Because we're making two ingredient, single origin, light roast chocolate. Um, so we have to go through bean by bean and sort them. Um, and, uh, and then we roast them in a modified coffee roaster. Um, then uh, and we cool the beans. And then we have to remove the shell. If you want to do this at home, just get a rolling pin, break them, break them up. Um, uh, we use machines. Uh, again, if you this is more for the home. If you want to make chocolate at home, get a hair dryer. You can blow away the shell. And so if you crack the beans and you blow away the shell, you'll be left with the nibs. The nibs are kind of like the meat of the bean. So you ever see cocoa nibs like an ice cream. All that is, it's a fermented, dried, roasted cocoa bean with the shell taken off, broken in little pieces. Um, so if you take those nibs and you um, either grind them uh, on a matate, sort of the old school way, uh, by hand, or um, if you put them through a peanut grinder, um, it'll start to look like chocolate. It won't taste very good at this Adam, point. what are you uh, thinking right yeah. now? Yeah. <laughs> 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 the visual on screen right now is really <laughs> So you grind your it's beans. Like living in the mission district. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh. 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 I live in the mission district. <laughs> I do too. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, go ahead. So you grind up your beans and you get something beginning to look like chocolate. Um, and then you can put them, these are the melangers we were talking about. These are the bigger ones. Um, the mini ones are smaller. And basically we grind the, the beans and the sugar together for about three to five days. Oh, wow. In our, and so if you do it at home, it'd only be about, a, be about a day. In our process at the larger factory, it's about three to five days. So we just grind and we grind and we grind. Um, we're reducing the particle size, but we're also um, mellowing out the flavor of the chocolate. Some of the stronger flavors go away. Um, and then, um, yeah, so these are melangers spinning. And then after that, we have chocolate and then we temper them. Um, uh, uh, sorry, I just will go straight ahead. Uh, so if we don't temper them, we'll end up with this. This is bloom. This is chocolate that's separated. So that's why oh. we have to temper the chocolate. We have to line the crystals and the cocoa butter to be shelf stable, as Greg was saying earlier. Um, and then we turn them into chocolate bars. Um, yeah. does, does the taste of chocolate change over time as it sits on the shelf in bar form? That like a wine does? Um, it does, and there's kind of a debate in the chocolate maker community about um, the appropriate time for aging chocolate. And we, we kind of, we did some studies and it was sort of inconclusive. So um, the thing that um, does change though is if you temper it or not. So I actually find one of the, one of my favorite ways to eat chocolate is actually you make your batch of chocolate and then you put it in a mold and you put it in the refrigerator. So you don't even temper it, but when it comes out, it actually tastes like fudge because it's in a different melting structure. Um, now it'd be hard to sell it that way because if someone leaves it out, it's gonna immediately bloom. Um, but so there's all these other interesting forms of chocolate that you can get with just, you know, two ingredient chocolate if you just, um, you don't even bother to temper it. So, um, but there are some people who age it or um, there's been talk about like aging in like, you know, instead of like wine barrels or like other sort of yeah, flavors yeah. you could add. Um, but some people age for like a couple weeks or a month. Now, we're soon going to go to audience Q&A, and there's a microphone in the back. If you have a question for these guys, you can line up. Uh, I have a question, though, for you, a last question before the Q&A. You've chosen this as your profession in your life. It's clearly an obsession. <laughs> there must be someone in each of your lives who hates chocolate. <laughs> How do you deal? What, what, what is that like? I don't know of anyone in my life who doesn't like really? chocolate. Really? Yeah, you eliminate them. <laughs> yeah. You get rid of them from yeah, your I don't life. Know. <laughs> Why would you talk to someone who doesn't like chocolate? I, uh, that doesn't, yeah. Really? No. Okay. <laughs> no, it's it's uh, almost everyone I've ever dated didn't like chocolate. It's very strange. I like. I think I have enough chocolate love for like <laughs> like the a radius around me, and then like yeah. you know anyone who comes near me is like, nah, chocolate. <laughs> He's got it all. It's fine. I am I'm personally the one who doesn't get the chocolate dessert. I always go for the fruity dessert while everyone else is getting the double chocolate. Or the dessert. white chocolate dessert. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm lucky. <laughs> 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 um, let's go to the audience Q&A. Has someone uh, stepped up to the microphone there? I didn't. I didn't expect to be the first person, but <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> I just returned from Ecuador, and the Ecuadorians told me, not surprisingly, that they felt that they had the best chocolate in the world. 
Now, I'm sure, I'm not gonna ask that question, but the question I have is if you taste a chocolate, can you tell kind of where it comes? Is there characteristics of altitude, location, something like that? Oh, that's a cool, um, I mean, there's a, so, so there's, there's one like party trick that I do. I go to weird parties um, <laughs> where, uh, um, so the South Pacific beans are often dried over fires or near fires. Um, and so they have a slightly smoky quality. So if you taste chocolate that tastes slightly smoky, it often means it's come from like Papua New Guinea or Solomon Islands or Vanuatu or somewhere near there. Um, but the reality is like it's, as much as you can try to categorize like, oh, like floral chocolate, floral beans come from Ecuador uh, and like, you know, um, spicy beans come from uh, Venezuela or something like that. It's, there's not a lot of like truisms out there. Uh, like it, it's very hard for someone, and a lot of people say they can, but I don't buy it. Um, that they can tell where a chocolate bar is from anywhere because it just depends on the beans and like, yeah, altitudes and the different genetics and how they're fermenting and how they're drying. All these things impact the flavor so heavily that it's, it's pretty hard to know definitively. Didn't I read in your book that, that, that even in the same bean, in the same pod, two beans, can, genetics can be radically different? Completely, yeah. I think one, one thing I would just add to that though is um, one thing that you can say about beans is that most of the new small makers are using a lot of the same bean suppliers. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, if you in general taste a Madagascar bar, it will be fruity. If you taste a bar from Ecuador, it'll be chocolatey. And that's uh, often a, a fact of we're all getting a lot of our beans from similar farms. But that's actually one of the things that's the most fun is go to Chocolate Covered and buy all of their Madagascar bars. They're almost all coming from the Akasin estate and do a tasting. And then you'll see, okay, this might be the same lot of beans, but every maker has their own unique style and point of view. And that, so it's super fun to see who's doing what and how they're doing it. There must be a time when you've tasted some competitors or com compatriots uh, chocolate bars and gone, oh, how did they do this? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I think a lot of that has to do with we have our particular style. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, this is the way we like to make our chocolate. And so um, oftentimes we taste someone else's bars and they're very different. It's like, it's just a different style. It's a different approach, but it's still really good. It's a whole different philosophy. Yeah. Different philosophy. Th there's yeah. a chocolate maker from Vietnam, Maru. The first time I tried one of their bars, I had to do what people often do at our bars, where like, look at the label, be like, this is just beans and sugar. There's something else in there. It, because it really was so spicy. There was so much kind of like cinnamony to it that I was like, come on, they added something there. And people do that with our bars a lot. They'll yeah. like look at the label and be like, so it's just beans and sugar. Um, it's fun. What's so bad about when two of the cocoa beans are stuck together? So it's the question, why do we throw out cocoa beans that are stuck together? Uh huh. Um, so the reason uh, we throw those out is um, they might not roast properly, or if we break them apart, then we might expose the shell and then they're not gonna roast um, super well. So theoretically, they, they should be okay beans, but just for our process, um, it might be hard to get a good chocolate out of them. I have a, I have a two part, I may have missed this. What is the namesake of dandelion? Mm. Uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, when we started the company, we looked at a lot of different names, and there were a lot of names that were very fancy, people's last names, uh, French words, fake French words. Um, <laughs> and, and we thought everyone was trying to be super, super fancy, and sometimes even sort of misrepresenting what they do about how far they go to the bean. And so we wanted a name that was real, and that was grounded, that was simple, yet beautiful, that had childhood nostalgia. And so we just kind of hit upon a name that fit the, the vibe of what we were doing, and it was an upstart and a weed. It's something that could grow and persevere, so it just, it just fit. And then the other part is how relevant is the sugar? Since it's beans to sugar, are you using consistent sugar? And how do you source the sugar to complement the beans? So, so um, early on, we sourced the sugar from, uh, from a very artisanal place called Costco. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, but over time, we thought maybe we should think about this a little more. Um, and, uh, but, and, and so you're, you're totally right. The, the, like the flavor that you get out of the sugar can overwhelm the chocolate. A lot of people use coconut palm sugar, which I think has a very specific flavor. Some people use stevia, which is a flavor I actually very much dislike myself. Um, and so we, we've tried a lot of different sugars and I've been in to and visited the people we work with on the sugar side, which is on uh, the native, uh, the Green Cane Project in Brazil. Um, it is the largest organic project in the world, not just sugar, but 
of any project. It's it's amazing what they do, uh, and um, what they do is like th the most sustainable thing I've ever. Okay, I'm not gonna rant about sugar forever, but it's great sugar. Um, and we we're using organic sugar uh, because um, essentially uh, the um, non-organic sugar is often not vegan, and so we wanted our bars to actually be vegan, not kind of vegan, and so we went to organic sugar so the bars could be totally vegan, which they are. Um, but it also, like, th the sugar you get really does very heavily impact the flavor of the chocolate, and there are some makers who will switch to a new sugar and you will immediately know it. As soon as you taste their chocolate, you're like, all your bars taste exactly the same because the sugar has too powerful a uh, flavor to it, and so you want to find some, uh, somewhere in the middle where it adds sweetness but not a lot of flavor itself. Um, yes, thank you for the samples. They were wonderful and, and the discussion. Um, a couple of San Francisco related questions since you said you wanted to locate here. First, there wasn't any mention by anyone of Ghirardelli, who, uh, which is certainly related to San Francisco's history and does try to show you a bit about chocolate making here. So I wondered about any influence from them. And the other is this is startup land <laughs> and John Scharfenberger sold out his startup um, made and I wondered if you guys were in the business of thinking well we got a great niche product here and someday we'll uh -huh. just sell it to the hard some part. unnamed <laughs> big guy um, I think it was two great questions so uh, the first question is about San Francisco being uh, what we all think of San Francisco as being a chocolate city so there has been actually a huge history of great companies you've got um, Giardelli you also have Guitard um, you had uh, Cho, um, Scharfenberger, who arguably kicked off the new American chocolate movement, um, and then a whole host of great chocolatiers like Ricuti. Um, so it just seems like uh, San Francisco has been in love with chocolate and has had a history of chocolate, and we kind of view ourselves as picking up the torch from Scharfenberger. I think if Scharfenberger hadn't sold out, we might not exist because um, that they really inspired us. Um, so the question of sort of selling out, I think, um, so... Uh, I actually, before Dandelion, I had a tech company that we sold, and uh, I've already had the experience of um, uh, sort of selling a company, and uh, you'd al we'd always joke, like, well, if you ever sold your company, like, what would you do? And it's like, well, start a chocolate factory. And so, um, <laughs> it, 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 so I feel like we've already sort of had the, the good fortune to, to get to do something that we really love, um, and can't imagine sell it like if we sold it we just have to start another one so it, it's no uh um so i i think we're just in the business of making good chocolate and uh trying to make more of it so first thank you for the really great entertaining program it's been really wonderful um first to admit either my cultural illiteracy or my complete uncoolness um, can you describe the cacao sketch? And if that's not sufficiently no. PG-13, um, <laughs> can you talk a little <laughs> bit you more? Want to just perform it right now? Is that, no. is that about the part about you the play? grades of chocolate uh, well, and if it's it's the crystalline structure or the uh, the balance of ingredients that makes the different levels of chocolate? So I guess that's a two part question. But if you have wait, to pass on the first, so okay, the cacao sketch is from a TV show called Portlandia. Where uh, Fred, Fred Armisen and Carrie Brownstein um, <laughs> swap their gender roles. Uh, she plays the man in the relationship, and he plays the the f woman, and they are fooling around when she, played by Fred Armisen, decides that it's too intense for her, and maybe they need a safe word, and the safe word becomes cacao, and she uses it past all reason yeah. throughout the course of the sketch. It's a very intense, and Carrie Brownstein, a, a woman playing a man in drag, has her voice pitch modulated to a very disturbing affect. <laughs> um, and it's a very intense, we were talking about it backstage, it's a sketch that is incredible because it plays to the whole history of, of comedy and men dressing up in drag, but then they add a woman in drag and it would be unwatchable if they were in their normal gender roles. It's a fascinating sketch. There you go. It, and it ends with cacao to cacao, which <laughs> is one of my favorite lines. <laughs> <laughs> what was the second part? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was looking, I think you described six different grades of chocolate, and if that's a function of the crystalline structure and the melting properties, or if it's a balance of ingredients that leads to that outcome. Oh, it's, it's yeah, it's six, six different crystalline forms that the cocoa butter, which is the fat from cocoa beans, can take. And so those six different um, 
crystalline forms are all defined by their melting point. And so what, what does get a little tricky is like when you make milk chocolate, you have different, you have additional types of fat then mixed in with the cocoa butter. And so it, it forms different crystalline structures based on that too. So if you're just using, if the only fat in your chocolate is uh, cocoa butter, then it's in, in some ways harder and some ways easier, but like it's much more sort of defined in terms of trying to get form five. When you add in uh, different fats, um, a lot of larger chocolate makers will take out the cocoa butter um, to sell them to people to make like, you know, that edible lip balm we discussed earlier. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and then they'll replace it with other kinds of oil, palm oil, et cetera, um, that doesn't have that same property. And so if you are trying to make chocolate that works well in a very hot environment, um, you don't want to use cocoa butter because it's gonna it's gonna melt at those temperatures. Where if you use something like palm oil, it won't melt the same way. It's also kind of gross, but I mean, you know, it's hot. And we have about four questions left. I'm surprised uh, I haven't heard anything yet on this, but. Um, do you foresee any threats or even opportunities uh, with climate change um, in, let me see if I can get the grammar correctly on this, but in chocolate sorcering? <laughs> <laughs> Sorcerizing. Sorcer um, <laughs> I apologize. Uh, no, I'm kidding, kidding. I'm not that chocolatier that we showed there. Yeah. Um, no. Uh, so, um, yes, so one of the things that I think is actually really interesting about um, climate change is a lot of people will debate, like, is climate change real, et cetera, et cetera. When you work with cocoa farmers and spend a lot of time with, with cocoa farmers and producers, like, these are people who, like, spend most of their time outside working with the environment. And they're like, hell yeah, the climate's changing. Like, anyone who believes otherwise is, like, not going outside often enough. Um, <laughs> you know, and, like, yeah, I mean. That checks out. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right, exactly right? Like, um, and, uh, but, but so, so, like, there was, a, there was an article that, that you might have seen recently about how, like, you know, cocoa could go extinct by 2050 if they don't start making genetically mod modified cocoa. That's not the headline, but that's what the article really was about. The article was about, like, they're starting to work on genetically modified cocoa. Um, I think the reality is, in terms of um, climate change, what most people are finding is not that it's gotten hotter or colder, but the weather is, is, is f inconsistent and frenetic and strange. Just like in San Francisco, right? Super hot, then super cold, and you're like, when, why does this happen? Well, if you're a cocoa farmer and you're relying on the ability to be able to dry beans, and it sometimes rains during the dry season and sometimes doesn't rain during the rainy season, um, it, part of the challenge is trying to grow the cocoa, but part of the challenge is trying to do high quality processing afterwards. And so this is actually having a really big impact on a lot of people we work with because they, you just can't, do the things you are used to doing because you used to be like, oh, during the dry season, it's always dry, so let's just assume we can put beans out in the sun and then take them in at night. But if you're constantly worried it's raining, you can't just put beans out and take them in at night. You have to like watch them and worry and like, you know, be ready to pull them in when it rains. So that's that's been a pretty big impact. I think there is an assumption that uh, where cocoa grows could shift. Um, so like right now, the only place in the U.S. that grows cocoa is Hawaii. Um, some people say it grows in Florida, but I haven't seen it, and I am not a believer until I see it. <laughs> um, uh, but like maybe cocoa will start growing in in Florida. You know, um, cocoa. In fairness, cocoa also grows in San Francisco in the Conservatory of Flowers. Um, <laughs> Have you uh, made chocolate with their cocoa? Um, Cynthia, our, our uh, education director, is working on uh, is working on trying. So she's doing test ferments of other beans to try to ferment them to to try to get those pods, ferment the beans, make a chocolate bar. I mean, it, they don't make that many pods, right. but like do like the eight San Francisco chocolate bars and then like auction them off for the conservatory or something, which would be super That's cool, awesome. right? That would like, be amazing. I think, so it's a great project. Um, so, uh, but yeah, so that's kind of how climate change is impacting it. It really has a huge impact. And like, honestly, it's what tons and tons of people talk about when we're talking to them. And like, they're fascinated that some people are somehow believing that this isn't happening. Like, cause it's just like, it's impossible to deny it. What what? About your, your suppliers, if they might not be able to make a living off of source of making the cocoa anymore? Um, it, it's possible, but I would say unlikely. Most people are finding avenues around it. Um, and most of the people we're working with, um, it would have to get 
uh, the climate would have to change pretty dramatically for them not to be able to grow cocoa at all. Um, it's really a question <coughs> of like, will they need to use mechanical dryers instead of sun drying and things like that. But like, this is why we build relationships with people that we want to work with for decades. It's not like this year we're buying those guys' beans because they taste good. It's like we're working with Coco Camille because we love working with Coco Camille, and then as things are shifting for them, we continue working with them. You know, it, so it's that's part of the reason we don't just buy whatever's cheapest or tastes best, but we try to build real relationships. Thank you so much for coming tonight, and thank you for the sweet treats. My first question is from my new friend that I met here at the Commonwealth Club, and she would like to know a lot more about the fermentation process, if you would. So, <laughs> sorry, I know I, the, the source arising makes me answer some of these questions. But um, so, so the fermentation process, um, typically, uh, like the, the goal of what you're trying to do is you're trying to get yeast to break down the sugar in the pulp, because it, it is a fruit, so there's a lot of sugar in it. So yeast breaks down that sugar, creates alcohol and heat. This creates a good environment for acetobacteria to, to reproduce, use that alcohol in conjunction with oxygen to produce acetic acid, vinegar. This acetic acid soaks into the cocoa beans and starts to break down cell walls and you know the it, like also starts to break down the proteins to some degree in the cocoa beans to form these flavor precursors. So like the way the best way to do it is you need to make sure you 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 have enough heat. And there's a bunch of different ways to do it. Uh, the guys we just started working with in Sierra Leone do basket ferments where they have a banana leaf and like put the wet cocoa beans in it and then they ferment. Ideally you'd have a sphere floating. <laughs> That's hard to do. Um, so no one does that. But um, a lot of people use boxes because cubes are similar to spheres in some ways. Um, <laughs> is, is, is that? Yeah, so I can talk a lot more about fermentation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this will be our last audience question. Okay, so this is um, a follow-on to climate change, but a little bit more about food justice too. And um, obviously, you're working with small farmers. Um, I have read that there's going to be a shortage for the mass market um, industry of chocolate, and that's sim simply going to put pressure on small farmers, et cetera. Um, but also, it's going to change the price of chocolate. And in one sense, it's not water, so it's not a human right, but it's certainly a human pleasure. <laughs> so <laughs> what does this really mean in terms of um, food justice in general and how you're looking at how you source the chocolate and whether you're going to capture a share of the mar mass market or change mass market to be more like you. Want to take this one too? Uh, I'll take part of it. I mean, I think, um, I think one of the things that's great about chocolate is it is an affordable luxury. So even some of the best chocolate in the entire world is maybe $12, $15 max. And you can't say that about wine or a lot of other things. It, it, yeah. um, so it's one of those things that um, w like we loved when we opened the, the you know, there's uh, lots of different people came into our shop um, and everyone came in and said, I love chocolate and I want to learn more and I want to have better chocolate. And um, even at a sort of a crazy high price point, it was still in the range of an occasional treat, treat for a lot of people. So I think uh, while we are trying to get a, a higher price for our bars and better uh, payments to our farmers, we're still going to be in the range where lots of people could share in some of the best chocolate in the world. Um, and and on, the, on the other side, I think th there's also um, cocoa is a commodity. And um, I, I encourage all of you to learn more about commodities and how they work and how in my opinion, frankly, unfair they are to producers because they take any of the negotiation power away from the producers because someone essentially comes in and says, this is the commodity price, this is the money I'm giving you, and it doesn't matter what, a, I mean, like, if someone came in to Dandelion and said, the price for chocolate is $3 <laughs> a bar, yeah. here you go, we'd be like, no, you can't have our bars, but, like, we're in the middle of San Francisco. If you live in the middle of Sierra Leone, you don't have people coming by all the time, and you're kind of just stuck with it. And so, like, I do think uh, uh, this is a really long topic. Let, let's, let's, I'll find you afterwards, and <laughs> let's discuss. Cause, but learn about commodities. Um, it is an uh, informed tradition to ask our speakers the following question um, for each of you. The same question. What is your 60-second idea to change the world? Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Todd's 60 second idea is Greg. My 60 second. No. Um, uh, so, so, 
I, so this is actually related to what I was just talking about. Uh, and I like clearly cocoa and chocolate is what I do for fun and it's what I do for work. Uh, I believe commodities really are not in the best interest of cocoa producers. Um, in the coffee industry, uh, about some less than 10, more than 5% of coffee in the world is disassociated from the commodity price. That means people selling that coffee can negotiate and say, this is what I think it's worth and someone will, 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 will pay that. Um, in cocoa, it's probably less than point I would, I would say it's less than 0.1% of the cocoa in the world is sold that way. Yeah, it's awful. It's really awful. And like, so I think the thing to change the world is like educate people about commodities and really work on decommodifying cacao and like, like hold large chocolate makers to task for how much they're paying for cocoa beans. Because like I've heard large chocolate makers talk about how like they're trying to like breed new plants that will be more productive so cocoa farmers can like grow more pods and that's how they make more money. And it's like, or pay them more. It's not that hard. <laughs> pay them more money and they will make more money. You know, um, and like, and especially with a lot of the large producers, they have big profit margins. You know, and 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 um, so I think decommodification of cacao is <laughs> the the thing I really care about. Um, please join me in giving a big round of applause to Todd and Greg. Uh, copies of their mouth-watering book, Making Chocolate from Bean to Bar to S'more, are on sale in the lobby. We're continuing the Chocolate Fest with samples and snacks and chocolate demos, so stick around. Thanks for joining us at Inforum at the Commonwealth Club, and have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks so awesome. much. Thank you, you guys are great. That's fabulous.